I've been meaning to branch out from Green Day pretty much since I first finished writing the OG scripts for Green Day's best albums, the trilogy of videos, which by the time the last part goes up will have pretty much gone from a single 20 minute video idea to a five part saga that's unnecessarily lasted almost a year. While none of them hold that special place in my heart quite like Green Day does, about a dozen other bands that all exemplify musical excellence to me in the bounds of what we generally consider punk sprung to mind, and honestly I'd love to talk about them all someday, but my choice for the next band to spend time focusing on wasn't just obvious, but almost inevitable. The degree to which I enjoy and respect Dead Kennedys just isn't fair to other bands. Every single human being talking about media of any type will always carry some sort of bias. It's unavoidable, it isn't inherently bad. But it does require any discussion I have about Dead Kennedys to be a measured one. That's why this video is titled what it is. I want to discuss this band, to examine aspects and elements of it which I enjoy or find interesting, or that I think are, for whatever reason, worthy of discussion. But due to my history with the band, my feelings for them through time and up to now, and a lot of the circumstances surrounding their music, I don't think the traditional review approach is the right way to do this. And while I hope this will be informative and entertaining and dialogue-inducing, the end goal here is, more than ever, to just talk about something that I feel is worth talking about. So, let's talk about Dead Kennedys. Dead Kennedys, which I'll usually probably just call DK from here on because Dead Kennedys is a mouthful, formed in 1978 from the San Francisco Bay Area. They're generally considered one of the pioneering bands of hardcore punk and as either a notable contributor or even a crucial guiding force in hyper-political punk. They're certainly a prolific band, and like many punk bands founded in the 70s, online discourse of them usually boils down to the effect they had on the scene in the context of history the importance they held to individual fans or subscenes in specific time periods, or discussion of them like a tragedy, drama, or some sort of cautionary tale. Like, this is true for most punk bands from this era, at least in general discussion, and personally I'm not super interested in any of this. If you watch my videos, you probably know my main interest is in the music. The composition, the themes, the musicianship, but all in the music, so I'll focus on that like I usually do. In 1979, DK dropped their first single and official release, though there are some demos predating the single, California Uber Alice. It was put out, like all their catalog, by an indie label created by singer Jello and guitarist East Bay Ray called Alternative Tentacles. California Uber Alice is essentially the Dead Kennedys' mission statement and was the perfect choice for the debut. The song is essentially just an instrumental surf song with that classic surf bass line and reverb drenched to piggy guitar, but with its drums pulled out and replaced with a military march hymn. Add on the booming, distant, and all-around dissonant backing vocal parts, and this track nails a special, potent juxtaposition. It might not be a super musically interesting song on paper, but that mood, that vibe it creates, is so distinct, so individual, it establishes the identity of the band immediately and pretty perfectly. And personally, for the first time and only time, I prefer the single cut to the album cut. It's slightly slower in tempo, which I think fits that foreboding aspect to the drumline, which is essential to the juxtaposition in that song. And while DK are a super political band, and the Venn diagram between Jello's politics and mine are closer to a circle than an eight, I'll mostly leave politics out. If I dive into politics, this video would be seven hours longer and ten times preachier, and IMO it's largely unnecessary. I don't think you really need to understand the political context of most of their songs to appreciate their satirical identity, and of course you don't need to appreciate their stellar musicianship. I got into DK years ago when I considered myself apolitical and didn't pay attention to politics in the music I listened to, and they didn't play a role in me becoming how political I am now. So while it might not be true for every hyper-political punk band, I really do think that DK can essentially be fully enjoyed without fully addressing that aspect of the music. It's there, but it really does function more as a cherry on top for the people who really dig Jello's political messages. In fall 1980, DK dropped their debut LP, Fresh Fruit for Rotten Vegetables, and off the bat, it's the hardest but also kind of the most interesting DK album to discuss. The sounds on this album generally pull from either a general, fast, angry punk sound, or a vocal, melodic surf sound, and of course these are usually accented with DK's almost theatrical satire and heavy sarcasm, and these sounds are mixed together at varying ratios. In many ways, these songs are more about statement and identity than they are about making an album in their traditional sense. The opening song, Kill the Poor, revs up a mainstream 60s surf pop rock thing with so much dedication to the sound's repetition and cliches that it feels hand-chosen to maximize the discomfort of the happy, easy-to-swallow tune with the horrifically satirical and cynical lyrics. 
A little punk influence and a little instrumental surf influence grounds it, but on the whole, the song was constructed in a way to maximize that message and that DK identity. And despite a baseline that's a lot better than it needed to be, it could be argued that the song sacrifices more theoretically satisfying instrumentals to ensure its message is the strongest it can be. I think Kill the Poor triumphs at this juxtaposition and justifies its use, but that doesn't necessarily apply to every attempt on the album. The weirdest thing about the balance of the elements of this album is it isn't always clear what was intended. Forward to Death is obviously a callback to a more bread and butter punk sound, but then When You Get Drafted seems to be trying to blend the two sounds almost 50-50. In fact, they can probably extend to like half the songs on this record. Over and over, it seems to be trying out how to achieve that punk rawness while keeping the satirical angle prominent. And my main takeaway is when it works, it really works. Let's Lynch the Landlord gives the guitar line to a more punky influence, but then it has a cheery, fancy-free, almost walking bass line. The album's best material deliberately mismatches it influences. The songs are a little more internally consistent than California Uber Alice, but follows a similar approach. This isn't to say the album never tries to find ways to harmonize the two sounds on a deeper level. Songs like Drug Me seem to be getting at something like that. It's more that DK, at this point, don't seem hyper-interested in making it harmonious. The attitude on this record is like, okay, the bass line's too bouncy, the melody is too repetitive and poppy, well fuck you, we're dead Kennedys. On a surface level, the way they mash all this together might seem lazy or careless, but after dozens of plays, I think it's very deliberately like this. A lot of songs don't really work from a composition perspective because they don't want them to. This is a record where very skilled musicians pretty much make all the songs how they want. Chemistry, in the traditional sense, can just kind of get fucked. And since everyone's committed to that, it kind of goes all the way around and the potential dysfunction and awkwardness becomes this intentional and totally valid sound in and of itself. It's almost like they were determined to prove that talented musicians can make satisfying music while directly avoiding decisions that, on paper, would obviously make the music better. Actually, with the ethos of punk at the time, and with the ethos of the band, I kind of think that, at least on some level, that was the intention. The end result of all this is that, for most of its runtime, Fresh Fruit accomplishes a sound that's just really admirable and impressive. It makes you accept it for what it is, and once it clicks with you, its frantic, manic speed and ego and general ethos of deliberate chaos is a lot of fun. And seeing it like this, I totally understand the connection to hardcore that people draw there. So that being said, even though the musical dysfunction seems deliberate and was pulled off well, it's still dysfunctional. The album generally has little to no flow, and when pulled out of context of the album, some of the songs just don't have much to stand on. All this to say that while I enjoy the hell out of this release, I also can totally see how it just might not do much or anything for other listeners. It's really up to if you enjoy that theatrical, manic, satirical vibe enough. If you want a straight-up punk experience, this probably isn't the album for you. You have to be willing to accept it on its own terms. The sole exception to this is the second to last track, and I want to make this clear. There are two versions of the song, one that's about three and a half minutes and one that's about four and a half. The three and a half one is the one in compilations and shit and is the only one I see online, but I insist. If you've never heard the four and a half minute version, you've never heard this song. Holiday in Cambodia is not a merger of sounds like the other songs on this record. The simplest way I can possibly word it is that Holiday in Cambodia is, at the same time, 100% a phenomenal instrumental surf track, and 100% a phenomenal punk track. It pulls off this impressive, impossible accomplishment of totally being both, like every component, be it the sheer musicianship, the interplay, the melody and rhythm, its flow, its vibe, everything adds up to being a creative, distinctive, and inventive instrumental track standing among the best of the 60s, and it all adds up to being a creative, distinctive, and inventive punk track standing among the best of the 80s. It's both. It's totally and holistically both, and I don't know how they did it, but they did. To try to clarify this some more, I don't think this even counts as surf punk, because broadly speaking, surf punk bands like Aiden Orange took hardcore punk in one hand and surf in the other and threaded the influences together, so there's a level of compromise there. Surf punk isn't wholly hardcore and it isn't wholly surf, it becomes something new. This isn't that. This is, at the same time, a song written to be surf and a song written to be punk, with no compromise. It's a strong-ass song when viewed through either lens, no changes required. It's just... Some other level shit. Holy fuck, I love this song.
I'm not sure if this was the goal with other songs on the album, but my impression is here at the end of the record that DK decided they'd been fucking around and experimenting long enough, and they decided to let that persona drop and just kick some compositional ass. And this, the strongest song of the album, being followed up by a tongue-in-cheek Elvis cover, confirms that to me. Like, they decided to go out on that note to balance everything back out. Because Holiday in Cambodia is kind of a point of no return. I love what they were doing over the course of this record, but once they step out and show how rawly talented they really are here, there's no way that they can really go back to what they were doing with the rest of the record. On at least some level, I think they knew about that. Even if it wasn't as deliberate as I feel it was, the quick shifts in sound on the following releases to more complex music verifies that, if nothing else, they knew they had new directions to grow into to better suit their talents. In God We Trust Inc. was an EP released in 1981. In the spirit of a single called The Too Drunk To Fuck, but more committedly so, the record blatantly tones down on the surf pop and throws DK's sound fully onto the straight-up punk influence presented, but scarcely 100% embraced on the last record. And no small thanks to the new drummer Plegro, the band absolutely lives in the fast tempo associated with your East Coast hardcore. Harvesting that influence back from the newer hardcore acts for this 14-minute EP gave me my favorite fast, angry DK track, Nazi Punk's Fuck Off. And again, that's just from composition, not even getting into politics. To me, this is clearly their best swing at traditional punk. And while, in my opinion, it's not as good as the stuff it was influenced by, like, I'll always spin Minor Threat or Agnostic Front or pretty much any other DC or New York hardcore band to get my fix of that sound, it is its own thing, and as its own thing, it's overall pretty solid. It isn't quite the same with the bass embracing a more funky and jazzy thing, and that kind of comes into fruition on We've Got a Bigger Problem Now, which is so jazzy but snide and sarcastic that it pretty much just becomes sky and spirit for half its run, before snapping into and out of and back into California Uber Alice 2, Ronald Reagan Boogaloo. <laughs> With their general identity established, and also kind of outgrown, and a dip into straight-up hardcore kind of one and done in a single EP, Dead Kennedys pretty much either had to remake one of their two previous releases, or they had to find a new way to innovate. Their second LP, Plastic Surgery Disasters, came out in 1982, and from its first track, it's clear what they did. The album opens up with a cryptid, distorted, condescending-as-fuck disclaimer from a femme announcer, as the band tunes her instruments in hell in the background. This snaps into Government Flu, a song which takes less than half a minute to establish a newfound and deep-rooted respect for song flow and development. The sheer energy in the song, from all parties as it winds up and down, is reminiscent of East Coast hardcore, but that sneery aesthetic is now cooked into the core of the melody. It's so all over the place that it reminds me of the kind of melodic hardcore not widely seen for another decade or two. The next song brings in a ska and playfulness, but unlike the debut album, the greater song stays focused, and my favorite thing about this album becomes more clear. Fresh Fruit played around a lot with surf and surf pop as an aesthetic, and mostly as a tool for juxtaposition. While the instrumentals could be truly great in that framework, overall that message remained the focus. On Plastic Surgery Disasters, the band, and especially the guitarist East Bay Ray, draw on instrumental surf. I hinted to this before, but to quickly run over it, since it's more relevant now, Surf began as an offshoot of instrumental rock, which in and of itself was sort of a reaction to mainstream rock in the 50s. Instrumental Surf, as it's called, sought to create atmospheric and compositionally interesting and often complicated music. Often without vocals, this initial movement, which persists on some level to today, innovated and popularized methods of reverb and picking and especially bass stylings to seen all over rock and especially punk. But over a few years, instrumental surf developed an offshoot genre, sometimes called vocal surf, or in my opinion, also the more accurate to the changes, the surf pop. Through surf pop, this innovative genre was, in part, brought back into the fold of the mainstream and homogenized into the repetitive pop that it first splintered away from. This version wound up considerably more popular to pop culture, especially in hindsight with the Beach Boys and all that, as it appealed to the mainstream 60s culture that wasn't quite ready for the then still mostly underground rock, which would swell to dominate the 70s. Needless to say, as you could probably tell, I'm a huge fucking fan of original instrumental surf. And as it turns out, East Bay Ray was too. This album is absolutely saturated with guitar lines clearly inspired by instrumental surf, even as other elements can go more gothic or hard or hoardery. He's abandoned the satirical edge and in place he and the bassist class earnestly build off this inspirational root. 
not a one-to-one -one recreation of surf like Holiday in Cambodia. This album uses a framework of the genre built off these ebbing and flowing structures with abrupt breaks and some inherent turbulence, and naturally transforms that into something a lot more intense and original. The innovation is best seen in the bass. As in surf, even when fast and frantic, it's not that flary and stays largely repetitive or semi-repetitive. On this album, though, the bass, starting with lines hyper-similar to classic instrumental surf, then takes the next step. Like half of these bass lines are some of my favorites ever, just for their creativity and the impressive combination of catchiness and flamboyance. Slipping between the surf influence and hardcore influence, sometimes in the same song several times, you can almost imagine the eargasms of 190s and early 2000s melodic hardcore bands who went on to do very similar things just in their own ways. This album has great flow in general, but I think in a forced song stretch from Buzz Bomb to Winnebago Warrior, thanks in large part to the surfy but also inventive bass and guitar, this album achieves the sound and attitude distinctly DK. Specifically, Halloween might be my favorite song from their catalog. After a bang of an opener, it properly opens with something very similar to a bouncy, bubbly pop bass line and a 50s-esque poppy guitar. The song slowly builds on itself and reiterates on these basic formulas, making them slightly more interesting and catchy until you find yourself at the end and the bass is doing this funk tier shit and the guitar is just wailing and the ride up was so natural that you don't bat an eye. If you only try one DK song after watching this video, consider making it Halloween, especially if you really appreciate melody and punk. Another standout track here is Riot. Starting with a slow, careful, and deliberate bass line and a spookyish, funkyish guitar thing, the generally frantic, chaotic, and energetic band then explode to probably the most frantic and energetic song to date. The booming presence of California Uber Alice, the badass bass work of this album, the frantic guitar work of the EP, throw it all in, double down, and just make the most shredding DK song possible. This is one of those songs where I feel physical pain just imagining playing it, and if it wasn't great enough, from here on the rest of the album doesn't let up. Instead it seeks out new ways to examine this frantic as fuck surfy, hardcore-ish sound. For example, I Am The Owl takes essentially the same thing, but ramps up the impact of the bass while the guitar lets up and into the haziness and does more of a traditional surf thing, and playing a more supportive role for that less traditional rhythm. Like at this point, I understand if the whole album starts dragging on or getting repetitive for some listeners, but if you're on board with the sound, I think it's a wonderfully gratuitous and satisfying second chunk to ride the hype wave to the end. Simply put, this is one of my favorite albums of all time. Easily top 10, maybe top 5. It's so energetic and impactful, the musicianship is so satisfying and interesting, I can loop this for hours. And in its original release, before the EP was bundled in on the CD, this album's last song was designed to match with its first, to encourage you to listen to it over and over again. It's that special type of repeatable that makes a small part of me wish I could only listen to music like this, like in a hypothetical world where there's only one type of music. This would probably be the best sound possible for me to live in a world like that, and I probably wouldn't complain. <laughs> Following plastic surgery disasters, DK took a few years off from writing new music, not returning with new material again until 1985. The third Dead Kennedys LP, titled Frankenchrist, initially picks up in form with the previous record. The opening song, Soup is Good Food, packs another super satisfying surf-based guitar line and bass line, but with an airier production and a mellower sound and tempo, and a much more relaxed vibe. The composition here is really allowed to breathe and be interesting in a slightly more meandering but nonetheless deliberate way. It's a wonderful new spin that's still loyal to the DK sound, and just as good as the previous material. The second song, Hell Nation, sets the second half of the sound for the album. Like Fresh Fruit, Frankenchrist melds that chiller sound together with the more ferocious sounds showcased in this song. The key difference between this angrier DK and the angrier DK in the past is that here, the guitar goes for a more 50-50 split between surf influence and a generalized hard rock or punk influence, and more importantly, the mania and frenzy drastically dialed down, to the extent that those descriptors often and don't really feel like they apply anymore. In places on the record, the endearing surf influence still bleeds and dominates, like in a hazed out guitar on This Could Be Anywhere, or the sharper picking on A Growing Boy Needs His Lunch, and the bass consistently calls back to the old sound once or twice in most songs. But as a whole, this decay is the, at their least distinct, with the individuality and a lot of that satirical identity toned down or at times essentially absent. That dialing back isn't inherently a bad thing, since it theoretically could allow the album to explore new sounds and experiment in genre crossing. 
Unfortunately, for the most part, this opportunity isn't exploited nearly as fully as it could be. MTV Get Off the Air, At My Job, and another couple songs follow in the footsteps of We've Got a Bigger Problem Now, and play with genre and humorous elements, but genuine genre crossing and musical exploration and experimentation occur in the minority of songs here. On its own, in a vacuum, the album is certainly solid and comfortably above average, but in the face of the rest of the band's output, which is always so distinct and saturated with personality, I can't help but be a bit disappointed that they sacrificed a lot of that sound and didn't really replace it with anything. My biggest takeaway for Frankenchrist is if you want to give it the fairest shot you can, you might want to listen to it before you listen to Plastic Surgery Disasters, and maybe even before you listen to Fresh Fruit, or maybe you could listen to it after, but after you take a few months of a break in between. The weirdness of the first album and its dedication to identity and personality might be a bigger issue here than the actual quality of Frankenchrist. If you let that expectation go, this album will certainly be more enjoyable. But as it is, I think it's certainly DK's weakest LP, and it might be their weakest studio release. And my issue with it boils down to that this album doesn't really justify why I should listen to it over the other DK releases, or over another band that does this more generalized version of punk better. Again, that doesn't make this a bad album. I want to be clear that this is a very solid listen with a lot of great musicianship. It simply lacks a special frenzy and creative spark that defined the other band's material and sort of elevates those records above. So, on paper, this album might seem equally guilty of what I just accused the last album of being. The majority of its 21 songs are about or less than two minutes long, which easily might from a distance seem like a ploy to dig into a general punk thing with simpler musical influence, though that's really not the case. The music here is skillfully played as ever, but once again also interested in a killer tempo and pushing itself with how energetic it can be. And thankfully, the short run times seem to give them an excuse to charge surf-influenced songs with as much DK energy in life as they possibly could. Also coupled with this breakneck pace is a measured, responsible return to old DK mania on many tracks, but responsibly rather than letting itself get caught up in recapturing the vibe as it always was, this album is littered with fresher attempts on its satire and experimentation, on its own ground with its own methods. To make it as short as I can, Bedtime for Democracy manages to capture the DK vibe while also giving itself plenty of freedom to experiment and do whatever the fuck it wants. Songs like Rambozo the Clown fuck with ska, jazz, and satirically poppy and mainstream sounds. And the album is littered with a surprising amount of samples and spoken parts, my favorite of which being a commercial, which as its name suggests is a mock MTV commercial. DK pretty much throw everything at the walls, one small part at a time. It's not the unyielding power frenzy of plastic surgery disasters. The bite-sized approach helps compartmentalize all of these random and loosely connected diversions. So while the album flow isn't amazing or anything, the identity of the album as a whole is pretty consistent and preserved. And also, to be clear, while they might not fit into the songs quite as well as on plastic surgery disasters, the bass lines on this record still fucking wreck. Along with these rapid-fire waves of songs, this album has two meaty six-minute tracks. Cesspools and Eden sees the idea of a chill DK from Frankenchrist through to its logical extreme. At the same time, it sounds like the lost best song from Frankenchrist and the lost sequel to Holiday in Cambodia, not quite reaching its punk heights, but returning to that super strong surf loyalty, now interjected with a more accommodating addition of poppier melodic elements. It's not as blatantly satirical, and is more just part of the vibe. It's got spooky minor chords, it's got some of the bounciest bass this band ever wrote. It's grade 8 at Kennedy's, and shouldn't get lost in the shuffle of short, simpler songs surrounding it. Chicken Chick Conformist is the other six minute song, and over its runtime, Jello almost never stops singing, and most of the chorus doesn't repeat lyrics, like two lines repeat a few times, but otherwise the song is a fucking novel. It switches between a slow song with a nice guitar line and fun bass work, and a classic fast paced punk thing, but the lyrics are the focus, even more than on any other time in the band's career. Chicken Chick Conformist is essentially Jello's take at the concepts of what makes real punk and fake punk, and unlike a lot of Redditor's takes on the situation, I pretty much completely agree with everything he has to say. The song does a wonderful job spelling out what Jello felt make punk what it is, and what threatened what it was, with way more nuance than just, if you sign to a label that makes you bad by default, or anything like that. If you can't keep up with Jello's brand of frantic singing, I think it's worth checking out what he has to say here, even if you need to look up lyrics to do so. And it hits really weird that this song came on DK's last album, that they broke up like a month after this came out. Anyway, set that aside for now. This album is definitely its own beast, but I think, for what it brings to the table, I like Bedtime for Democracy about as much as I do Fresh Fruit. It has a more consistent identity, but fewer songs that feel like classics. It has a few standout tracks. It has a lot to like and nothing to really dislike, with its worst crime being that some of the songs are kind of skippable. It's a solid last note for DK and another wonderful record. 
I've really enjoyed talking about this band, and I generally love them, but for some reason part of me feels some sort of obligation to address something, and I'm not totally sure why. Dead Kennedys broke up, and over 30 years later, Jello and the now-reformed rest of the band still aren't on good terms. It's hard not to pick sides. It's hard to resist the urge to side with the musicians who I just praised for like half an hour for making this music so outstanding. It's hard to not side with the singer who I share many ideologies and apparent traits with, seemingly including the ones that cause a band to end. So the, I guess the reason I'm bringing this up at all is to say I get it. If you love the music this band made, then that strong love is probably equally matched with other strong feelings about the whole situation. I get those too. But I'd like to encourage not dwelling on any of that in the comments below. I just spent a long time talking about this band on the merits of their music, in part because the discussion I see on the, about them online is seldom able to stay focused on the music without discussing other things, and the other things are overwhelmingly this thing. And I guess I want to say, this video isn't the place for that. And despite the accusations here, I don't think any of them warrant real personal attacks. There are far worse things musicians can do than sell out on their political ideologies or mishandle royalties. Let's talk about the music first and foremost. And maybe send your favorite DK record to someone you know who hasn't tried them yet. There's plenty worth liking.